Hi. So in this video, I'm going to talk about Robert Bolt's play, A Man for All Seasons. This is one of my favorite plays. Um, and I actually got to uh, serve as a dramaturg for this, uh, for a production of this play at the uh, Nittany Theater at the Barn uh, here in uh, central Pennsylvania. So this is a really interesting play for me, and, and I, I've got a, a pretty good handle on it, I think, based on the, the literary uh, and dramatic criticism I've done. Um, it's the story of the sort of late career and the downfall of Sir Thomas More, who uh, was one of the favorites of Henry VIII's court, but when Henry uh, broke with Rome or started to sort of move toward uh, breaking with the Roman Catholic Church, Moore, who was a devout Catholic, fell out of favor because he was reluctant to endorse uh, Henry's petition for divorce from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Um, so eventually, Moore was uh, executed for this. So A Man for All Seasons is a history play, fundamentally, that deals with uh, those historical events, but it's also a great existentialist play. Not in the sense of theater of the absurd, like you get with people like Samuel Beckett, uh, Eugene Ionesco, uh, and so on and so on, but in the sense of existentialist theater that you get with people like um, Albert Camus and Jean-Paul Sartre. And what that means in this case is that much of the action centers on more as an existential hero. So this is a character who is deeply devoted to his own personal truth and is willing to stand up against the king, the entire kingdom, his, uh, his friends, his family, the political and religious establishment in order to cling to that truth. And ultimately, he's willing to accept death in order to maintain that sort of fidelity to his own core beliefs. And so we see this continually uh, with more. Um, I want to point you just to a few bits and pieces. I think one of the most uh, one of the most direct instances we have of this sort of existential statement of purpose uh, is when Moore is talking with his friend Norfolk. Uh, and Norfolk is a sort of stereotypical upper class country gentleman type. Um, he's not much of a thinker, he's not much of a philosophizer but he plays a major role at court, and actually he becomes one of the big figures who tries to persuade Moore uh, to support the king's decision. And they're having an argument about whether or not the Pope is the direct inheritor of uh, St. Peter, and therefore uh, the only surviving link between uh, humanity and Jesus of Nazareth. And so uh, Norfolk says, it's basically says, it's just a theory, it's not worth sacrificing your career for. And Moore says, the apostolic succession of the Pope is, why it's a theory. Yes, you can't see it, can't touch it, it's a theory. But what matters to me is not whether it's true or not, but that I believe it to be true. Or rather, not that I believe it, but that I believe it. I trust I make myself obscure. 
And so that's one of... More is a great wit as well. So you get those lovely gems of like, I trust I make myself obscure. But this idea, what matters is not that I believe it, but that I believe it. So we get that devotion to his own existential truth as his sort of overriding uh, characteristic. We see this throughout, especially in the second half of the play. Um, often in conversations with Norfolk. We get it again later on. Um, Norfolk sarcastically says, the one fixed point in the world of changing friendships is that Thomas More will not give in. And More says, to me it has to be, for that's myself. Affection goes as deep in me as you think, but only God is love right through, Howard, and that's myself. So there's this continuous rhetoric of self, of selfhood. Um, and, and Moore actually also poses this question to Norfolk when he says, is there no single sinew in the midst of this, this being Norfolk, that serves no appetite of Norfolk's but is just Norfolk? So he's about essences, the sort of core truth of the person. Um, and, and so this this notion for more is tied to a lot of things. It's tied to his religion, it's tied to morality, um, and it's tied to the law. And so I want to give you just a couple more pieces here. Um, once he's been arrested and he's been in prison for a while, uh, Cromwell, uh, Sir Thomas Cromwell, who becomes his sort of main persecutor, who's, who's tasked with getting more uh, either to confess treason or to support uh, the divorce. Uh, Moore, Cromwell allows Moore's family to come visit him in prison to try and persuade him to give in. Um, and Moore has a philosophical debate with his daughter Margaret, uh, who he's taught much, much more than most young women uh, learned in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. Uh, and Moore makes this argument, if we lived in a state where virtue is profitable, common sense would make us good and greed would make us saintly, and we'd live like animals or angels in the happy land that needs no heroes. But since in fact we, we see that avarice, anger, envy, pride, sloth, lust, and stupidity commonly profit far beyond humility, chastity, fortitude, justice, and thought, and we have to choose to be human at all, why then perhaps we must stand fast a little, even at the risk of being heroes. So again, this idea of the true self, the core self, uh, is, is tied to morality and tied to this sort of existential uh, heroism. But the other element of this is that Moore is a lawyer, and so much of this play revolves around his faith in the law as something that can protect you when you're innocent, something that protects those who deserve to be protected. And I want to read this last passage here because I think it's one of the best passages of any play I've ever read. Um, his son-in-law, William Roper, uh, is a, a staunch Puritan. He actually changes his religious views throughout the play, but um, for the early portion of the play, he's a staunch Puritan, so Roper is all rah, rah, let's go get the devil and all this. Um, and uh, Roper doesn't believe that the Pope uh, should get the benefit of a legal defense. Um, and, and Moore says basically that even if it was the devil, he would give him the benefit of legal defense. And Roper is outraged at this idea. Um, 
And Moore says, yes, what would you do? Cut a great road through the law to get after the devil? Roper says, I'd cut down every law in England to do that. And Moore says, oh, and when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper, the laws all being flat? This country's planted thick with laws from coast to coast, man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down, and you're just the man to do it, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes, I'd give the devil the benefit of law for my own safety's sake. So that's the other sort of component here, this sort of existential devotion to the self, which is rooted in faith, rooted in, in uh, Moore's belief. But we've also got this devotion to the idea of the law as something that protects the innocent, protects those who have nothing to fear. And this, of course, is the much more shaky supposition because while Moore ultimately does get to be the existential hero and go to his death uh, for what he believes in, Cromwell finds a way around the law. Cromwell is a tricky dude and uh, through bribery and through uh, getting uh, uh, getting a, a young man eager for uh, political advancement to uh, bear false witness against Moore, they end up convicting him, even though in reality his legal defense should have been airtight. <laughs>